Good morning, good afternoon. I'm not sure where everyone is, uh, but it's uh, nice to have you here. And so today what I'd like to do is I'd like to go and talk about um, some of the multivariate analysis and advanced data analysis methods that are available for time of flight sims. I'm assuming that you already understand some of the basics of analyzing data, so we're not going to go through those. And I'm not going to be able to cover every single uh, multivariate analysis method. Um, I'm also, I'm not going to go really into the software I've written, but I do have links uh, to where you can find that. And there are tutorials online for that. And um, But most everything I'm showing you today was done with the toolbox that I created. Uh, let's see if I can get my slides to advance. So I'm not sure why this is blurry, but I come from the University of Washington. I work in a center called NESEC Bio and also the MAF or Molecular Analysis Facility, which are facilities for uh, the MAF is a characterization facility and NESEC Bio uh, is a core research facility where we do research on biomedical surface analysis. So we all know that TOF sims is complicated. Uh, it The data is very rich. It has both spectra. We have images in those spectra. There's peaks. There's all sorts of information. And we have to somehow figure out what is the important information within that data set and uh, be able to extract that and summarize it in a way that's understandable. So when we talk about multivariate analysis, uh, multivariate just means more than one variable, it's multi and variable. Um, and it pertains to the analysis of multiple variables. This could be a wide range of things. Uh, so it could be responses measured from multiple instruments. For example, you could take data from, uh, from XPS sims and contact angle and combine them into analysis, or it can be multiple responses from a single measurement. For example, uh, multiple top sims peak intensities, which is what we're going to be talking about today. And most multivariate analysis methods look at the dependence or covariance between different variables. So it's trying to determine what are the variables that are changing together, how are they related, and in the case of sims and sims imaging, where are those variables or those peaks uh, located? And the variable can be anything that you can measure. And for SIMS data, it's usually intensity of a peak that we're looking at and feeding into the data algorithms. So you probably heard a lot of things about multivariate analysis and you may ask yourself, wow, that sounds great. Should I use it all the time? And my answer is no. If you only have a few variables or if you just have a very simple question you're trying to answer with SIMS, um, then it's best to just use your standard SIMS analysis methods. And I always give the example that if you plotted the amount of time I lecture about multivariate analysis versus the number of people who fall asleep, you'd probably see a linear trend uh, that would be very easy to understand without doing any advanced uh, data analysis methods. So when we're thinking about doing some sort of multivariate analysis, it's important to think about what the goal of your experiment is. Uh, and I put these into three different groups. There's exploratory analysis, guided analysis, and predictive analysis. And the, depending on what you're trying to do, there's a, a range of different multivariate analysis methods that can be helpful. For example, if you're just doing exploratory analysis where you have a, a set of data and you're trying to figure out what are the peaks that are changing, uh, where is that change happening and you don't know a lot about the system, you could use things like principal components analysis, uh, maximum autocorrelation factors, some sort of factor analysis. If you know something about your sample, for example, you uh, have two samples that you know the composition of and you want to ask the question, how? what are the differences between these? You could do something like discriminant analysis, which you actually feed in the information about which sample is which, and the algorithm tries to determine what the differences are. And then there's some predictive analysis you could do like partial least squares or principal component regression, where you're trying to, uh, you have some data from your SIMS and data from another method, and you're trying to correlate a relationship between uh, those results. 
So each of these different methods have different goals. For example, principal components analysis looks for the maximum directions of variance within a data set. Uh, that those, uh, I'll explain more about what that actually means, but really that means that whatever the biggest differences in your data set are, principal components analysis will find that. And it's important to understand because often that means it's just going to determine uh, differences between contamination or some sort of sample preparation factor. Maximum autocorrelation factors or math finds a linear combination of peaks to maximize variance across an image uh, while minimizing vari variation between neighboring pixels. And the short story of what that means is that it's able to uh, determine differences in your data across an image or a data set um, and it, it keeps some information about what is present in neighboring pixels. And because of the way that algorithm happens and works, uh, math doesn't need any type of pre-processing, uh, which is one advantage. And then MCR or multivariate curve resolution tries to deconvolute your data into so-called pure components using a partial least squares analysis or algorithm. Um, and each of these methods has a, a can be used in different ways, and we'll we'll talk a little bit more about that. <clears throat> so to start out with, just talking about exploratory analysis. Here we're looking for differences, and it could be something like you have different treatment times, you have different sample outcomes, whatever it is. You're just trying to figure out what's different in a data in a data set. And in these types of uh, analysis, there's usually we don't have a lot of pre-knowledge about what the samples are or what the differences are. And so here we can choose an unsupervised multivariate anal analysis method. And unsupervised just means that we're not telling the algorithm which sample is which or anything about the samples. We're just, we're putting the data in. And there's lots of different ways we can do that. We can simply just look at intensity trends by plotting the data. There's, uh, and then there's these different multivariate analysis methods that we can use for that. <clears throat> when we're, if we're looking for something where we know something about the samples, uh, we can <clears throat> um, start simple and just verify that the peaks of interest are present and look at where these peaks are. Uh, so just you doing that manually, or we can use a supervised method like discriminant analysis and as I mentioned before, discriminant analysis, we can say, we can ask the question, what's different between A and B, samples A and B, where we're actually telling the algorithm which sample is which, and it's trying to then maximize the, uh, or look at what the maximum differences are between those samples. Um, MCR, uh, is it is actually, I call it a guided multivariate analysis method because you have to give it some sort of initial guess into what how many components you have and some information about the samples um, for it to come up with a solution. And so uh, it is a type of guided analysis. And then the uh, predictive analysis, once again, this is where we have a data, our SIMS data and some corollary measurement. So it could be protein absorption or some sort of outcome that happened on your sample set. And then you can build a model that tries to predict the outcome based on a new set of SIMS spectra or inputs. Can you actually see my cursor when I move it? Yeah. Okay. Because yeah. I'm moving my cursor and I just realized, I don't know if anyone knows where I'm putting it, but that's good to know. <clears throat> so when, uh, I always like to start and say that when, um, when you're going to, think about using multivariate analysis, you need to start at the very beginning with a good experimental design. And at the University of Washington, there's a lot of construction going on almost all the time. And they have this sign on the fences um, for the workers that go into the construction sites. And they they say, plan the work and work the plan. And I, I think that we can do a corollary thing with SIMS data that we want to we want to plan the work and work the plan, meaning we want to make sure we have a good experimental design and we carefully carry out that design because otherwise uh, we can use these methods, but they're not going to help us if we don't have a good set of inputs to start with. So I always say that 
if you put garbage in, you're going to get garbage out. You can you can put any set of data in through a multivariate analysis method, but if you don't have some plan of how that you're doing that, you'll get an uh, some sort of results, but they probably won't be interpretable or useful. Um, and so this is my steps to multivariate analysis. Uh, you plan your experimental plan, you collect the data, you have to calibrate the data and make sure that it's uh, calibrated properly. You have to do some sort of peak selection. You have to do some pre-processing. And then finally, at the end of that, you're able to run the method and in try to interpret the data. But it's important that each one of these steps is done properly. Um, I on, In our website here, uh, at Nesic Bio, I have a bunch of tutorials that go over a lot of the information that I'm going to talk about today. The slides from this presentation will be up there short, uh, shortly after the presentation, and I'll make sure I get a link uh, to the people at the North American Sim Society so they can link that to anyone who's interested. So some other important notes. Most of the multivariate analysis methods are statistically based um or statistical ba based and so you need some sort of good hypothesis and reason why you're giving you're using them and you also need to collect enough data and th this is a really important point uh i've reviewed a lot of papers where people collect one or two spectra on a sample and then run it through principal components analysis or some other multivariate analysis method and you really cannot get a statistically significant result from only a couple of data points. Um, so you really need to think about how much data you need to collect. Um, and you also need to display and interpret the data correctly. And we'll go over what I mean by this. And in, in most method, multivariate analysis methods, you end up with uh, something called a score and something called a loading. These could be called factors and factor loadings, but in either case, um, you need to make sure that you're displaying all of the data. You cannot just show the scores and have that be a complete uh, analysis to report of your data. And as I mentioned before, our experimental design, we need to think about what we want to learn. It's best if we can simplify the number of variables that we're dealing with in an experiment. Um, with multivariate analysis methods and, and SIMS data, I always say it's best to use one single variable that you're changing. So maybe you have a set of samples and you're changing the treatment time or the concentration. Um, but if you if you change just one variable, then you can use your multivariate analysis methods to kind of, I say, lever out that information because the changes that you see in your SIMS spectra uh, will be related to the changes in those variables. Um, and then we need to run enough or collect enough data, as I mentioned before. Our quick rule of thumb that we use is for homogeneous or re reproducible samples. Uh, we recommend collecting three to five spots on two sample replicates. And if you have something that's not homogeneous or not reproducible, to collect five to seven spots on three to five samples uh, for spectral analysis. And just a quick example of what I mean by that, this is data from self-assembled monolayers. So we have different chain links in the x-axis and we have our uh, principal component scores uh, in the y-axis here. And here I'm showing data, each dot represents a spectrum and there's three spots per sample on two samples. So there's six data points in each of these data clusters. And you can see in some cases they completely overlap uh, showing that these, this data is reproducible. So having six data points is sufficient to be able to distinguish differences between these samples. If we switch to, this is data from Matt Wagner, who was a, a graduate student many, many years ago in our group. Um, and he collected data of uh, proteins absorbed onto mica. And this is actually just a subset of the data he collected. Um, and you can see that you know, these different proteins cluster together here. This is the principal component one versus principal component two plot. Um, but if you look at the entire data set that he collected, you can still see that the different proteins cluster together. And these the ellipses here are 95% confidence ellipses uh, in the analysis. 
Um, but you can also note that there's a lot of spread in the data. So if you'd only collected one or two data points on these samples, you wouldn't have a real understanding of the statistical variation uh, in the samples themselves. Once you have data, it's important that you calibrate it properly. For a given data set, uh, all the data for a given experiment should be calibrated with the same set of peaks. And you should always check your calibration. So here on the left, I'm showing uh, a series of spectra that were collected. And this is, bef this is before checking the calibration. You can see there's quite a shift between some of these uh, peaks. And if this was a if the data was already calibrated properly, a sh this type of shift would indicate that there's a second peak present here. But after we check the calibration and recalibrate the data, you can see everything pretty much overlaps on one single peak. And it's important to do that because when we start uh, in a, getting peak areas, we need to make sure that we're being consistent and integrating the area from just a single peak uh, when we're putting that into the analysis. So there, there are some debates still about peak selection. Uh, some people want to just throw an entire sim spectra into these algorithms, which is possible. Um, however, I, I think that's really just kind of a waste of resources because the, the data sets can be very large and the majority of the mass bins in a sim spectra is background noise. And so it really doesn't make sense to throw a bunch of background noise into the, the algorithm, in my opinion. Um, so I always say, unless there's some reason you need the raw data, so maybe you're doing something trying to assess differences in, in background or other trends, that you should do some sort of peak picking. Uh, this helps reduce the data size significantly. And when we're talking about SIMS data, um, you can have you know, data sets that range from hundreds of megabytes up to 10, 20, 50 gigabytes, depending on the, the data set. Um, it also focuses, by peak picking, it focuses, focuses the analysis on the actual peaks and not the background. It can be time consuming uh, because you have to go through and select peaks, but in my opinion, the hour or two that you spend peak picking is uh, well worth the effort. Um, and if if you're not doing this, you can meet uh, you can miss things. So when you're making a peak list, the peak list needs to include all the peaks across all the samples. So it's very useful to overlay spectra. So this is a series from uh, once again some self-assembled monolayers. And I'm, I'm not sure how clearly you can see this, but there's different each different type of sample is colored differently. But you can see that there's, for example, here's uh, there's some red peaks that only show up in that spectrum. There's some blue and green peaks that only show up in those spectra. So if you want to do analysis across all of these samples, it's useful to overlay the data so you can go through and pick all the peaks across all the samples because ultimately we need uh, a representative peak set from all the data that we want to put into our algorithm. When we're picking peaks, it's important to set your integration limits carefully. Uh, and so here overlay is also very useful. And so we can see here, we have three different peaks. Uh, one of them is only showing up here in the blue spectra. So, uh, so we have our three different peaks. And if we're going to set our integration limits, we need to, it's good to set them consistently for all the peaks. And since we have overlapping peaks here, uh, you can see that we need to set the integration limit so we're minimizing the intensity that we're pulling from overlapping peaks. And so since this often happens in sim spectra, it's good to set all of your peak limits with a consistent peak width so that you're measuring your peak intensities uh, consistently across the data set. So once we have a set of peaks and we're ready to, to put them into the algorithm that we chose, it's usually typical that we need to do some sort of pre-treatment pre -treatment or data uh, uh, scaling. Um, and the, the most common things that people do is normalization, centering, and scaling. And the whole point of all these pre-treatments is to try to maximize differences that are due to the chemistry and the samples and minimize differences from other sources. And these other sources can be uh, 
uh, variability in the instrumentation when you're collecting the data. It could be uh, if you look at a sim spectra, for example, we know that the intensity of the low, the intensity of the low mass peaks uh, are much higher than the intensity of the higher mass peaks, um, and that just has to do with the ion transport into the detector. But because of that, the the mean intensity of the lower mass peaks um, is much higher. And so if we don't do some sort of pretreatment, uh, we can often end up just looking at differences between uh, the mean intensities and not differences between the chemistry. Anytime you do some sort of pretreatment, you need to understand the assumptions that are being made with that treat pretreatment and make sure that they're valid because it is possible to treat your data in a way that is not valid for the type of data that you're analyzing. Um, there haven't been really any standards set uh, in the SIMS community for uh, doing um, pretreatment, but there are some good recommendations. Uh, I I think you should never auto scale SIMS data. Uh, it gives you pretty re looking results, but the results are almost always meaningless and very difficult to interpret. Um, the So it's important to scale the data according to the noise structure within your data. If you have a, uh, a time of flight detector with a, um, a single ion counting uh, detector system, then your data will follow Poisson statistics. And so for Poisson statistics, doing a square root transfer form or dividing by the square root of the mean and then mean centering the data uh, will give you a consistent result and is uh, valid for that type of data. And for images, there's a, a scaling that's known as Poisson scaling, or you can do a square root transform um, which are also valid for Poisson distributed data. <clears throat> for normalizing, it, it pr pretty much always recommended that you normalize your data if you're looking at spectra and looking at peak intensities, um, either normalizing to the total counts or some of selected peaks, depending on what you're looking at. And for images, in most cases, um, you don't need to normalize unless sometimes it's if you have some sort of topography issue in your image normalization can help remove that if you don't normalize your image data your first uh, uh, factor that you calculate with your multivariate analysis method will uh, basically capture the differences in the means in the data set and and not be particularly useful but subsequent principal components analysis uh, subsequent factors will have information about your chemistry. <clears throat> so a bit more about normalization. Here we're trying to take out differences that are due to topography, to sample charging, or some sort of instrument conditions. Um, there's lots of different ways that people normalize data, and um, it's important to think about what you're trying to look at. The most common and most uh, typically recommended Normalization is to normalize by the total intensity because uh, this usually will remove any uh, variation due to like different intensity from diff sample to spot to sample spot. Um, if you're only if you're looking at a subset of peaks, for example, you've done an analysis and found that if you use all the peaks, uh, you don't uh, you're not pulling out any interpretable trends. Sometimes if you look at a subset of the peaks. Uh, so let's say you remove salts and some other contaminant peaks, um, you can rerun the analysis. And in that case, it's best to normalize to the sum of selected peaks because in, in that analysis, you're trying to look at what is the variation within that selected set of peaks. There's some other types of normalization you can do depending on if you're doing some sort of specific analysis. For example, if you're trying to look at how your data varies relative to a certain peak in your spectra, you could normalize to that peak. But once again, you need to know your assumptions you're, that are being made and also understand that anytime you normalize, you're removing information from the data set. So for example, if you normalize by the total intensity, you're removing the total intensity trends from the data set. So if you are doing an experiment where you're looking at like total ion yields from a set of samples, 
if you normalize the data, you're actually removing that information from the data set. So you would not want to normalize in that case. <clears throat> mean centering, <clears throat> excuse me, mean centering subtracts the mean uh, from each variable. And so if you had a, a set of SIMS data and you don't mean center, the means are going to be different because each of the peaks has different intensity and is varying across different scales. Uh, and so after you, if you take and then subtract the mean from each of the variables, you then have all your variables that are now varying with a common mean of zero. Um, and typically this is almost always recommended because we don't we're not typically interested in the differences between the means of the sample. We're interested in the differences in the changes in those variables uh, relative to the other peaks. And if you don't mean center, you'll basically all your low mass peaks will be dominant in your analysis because they have higher intensities and therefore typically have higher variation uh, in the, the data. Scaling attempts to account for differences in variance between different variables. Um, I mentioned before the, the Poisson scaling, which takes into account the Poisson noise structure. Um, and so this, this is basically, we're trying to uh, um, normalize the, the scale of the different peaks across the spectrum so that uh, we give more equal uh, variance to the different peaks. So for example, if you divide, or if you square root transform or divide by the square root of the mean, um, you kind of normalize out the, the absolute peak differences between uh, your data across the data set. <clears throat> so we've got a, a set of data. We've done the pre-processing to uh, get the data ready to do our analysis method. Um, so what are these methods actually doing? So in, a, in a many cases, multivariate analysis is a type of axis rotation. And uh, why is an axis rotation useful? So this is a slide that was developed by Bonnie Tyler. Um, and in her example here, if we have a ball rolling down an inclined plane, um, if we keep a standard uh, axis set here, um, we then have a, uh, we have to solve the equations of motion in two directions in order to understand this system. However, if we rotate the axes, so uh, we now have one axis parallel to the plane and one perpendicular, um, we can uh, simplify the, the math. Of, in, in this case, we're ignoring gravity, but if we're just looking at the motion down this plane, we can simplify the solution to this problem uh, by doing this axis rotation. And so in principle components analysis, we're doing an axis rotation and we're going to define two new uh, matrices. One is a score, which uh, the definition is the amount of the new variable in each sample and a loading, which is the contribution of the old variables to the new variables. And I'll explain this uh, more in subsequent slides. So as I mentioned, uh, principal components analysis does a axis rotation. So if we had a data set here, we have three different data from three different samples plotted in X and Y. Uh, we can see that the largest difference between these samples is along this kind of 45 degree angle. And so if we were running principal components analysis on this data set, it would uh, place principal component one along this axis of major var variation here. And then subsequent principal components are placed orthogonal to that original axis, capturing the next direction of the variance, which would be the scatter in the data sets in this direction. And then the, the score, as I had mentioned, that it's the amount of the, the uh, sample on the new variable. And basically what that means is we're doing a projection of those data points onto the principal component axis. So for principal component one, uh, the data would be projected like this, and for principal component two to be projected projected down onto the principal component two axis. And then the loadings are the direction cosines between the original axes and the new axes. 
And so if you remember with cosine, the cosine of 90 is zero and the cosine of zero is one. So uh, that means that a small angle has a high loading. And what that means is if there's a small angle, that means that that original variable had a uh, has a high influence on the positioning of that new principal component axis. So that uh, that peak with a high loading has a, a a large contribution to the separation between the samples. So this is also a slide from Bonnie Tyler uh, that I like a lot. So she generated these are computer generated images from peak one and peak two, and it shows the distri distribution of the peak area counts. And if you squint, you can see that there's probably some sort of checkerboard pattern uh, here in the data. If we then plot the peak one counts versus peak two counts, you can see that there's two groupings here uh, in, the, in this data cloud. And so if we create a new axis that goes perpendicular to these data clouds here and project the data onto these this new axis, we can generate an image where we now clearly can see the distributions of the two ions. And you can see that we still capture the histogram distributions of the peak counts. Um, and so doing this type of rotation can actually simplify the interpretation of the data. Uh, and that's what's happening in a lot of these multivariate analysis methods is we're doing a rotation um, to basically capture the, the differences that we're seeing within the samples. And so the, the different methods are basically a different type of axis rotation in many cases. So, um, and we've, I've mentioned many of these already before, but the point here is that uh, these different solutions um, or different methods to get a solution from your data are basically different uh, axis rotations that are done to uh, um, to get an answer between what your your data is. Um, and one thing I always like to point out that you need to choose the method based on the goals of the analysis, and that really none of these methods is better than another. I, I often see this either in talks or in people's papers where they're, where they're where they will say method X is better than method Y because, and they give some reasoning. Um, however, that's really just a statement about the actual particular data set that they were looking at, that maybe one method gave them an answer that it was easier to interpret. But in the end, all these methods are just tools and they all have different goals and different reasons why you would use them. And so the, the real thing is to use the method that gives you the answer or helps you get an answer that most clearly describes uh, the data. Um, so I'm gonna go over a little bit about principal component analysis math. Um, I'm not gonna go into a lot of details because uh, there's a lot of references that you can um, you can read here. And you'll note some of these are quite old. Um, however, these uh, some of these older papers give excellent descriptions of the math uh, and actually give some examples that you can follow along with and uh, really understand um, what's happening when you're running these types of algorithms. Um, so we, I, I say the word variance a lot. And um, so variance is a measure of the spread of the data. So uh, we have basically, we're looking at the difference of the means uh, in a data. And covariance is a measure of a degree of that two variables vary together. And so, uh, PCA, principal components analysis, is calculated from a covariance matrix. And so uh, you can see this the equation for the covariance matrix. So we're looking at how things vary together. And then when we do principal components analysis, we take our original matrix and it gets reconstructed into a set of our scores and loadings. Uh, and then some residual matrix. So the this residual matrix uh, is just uh, random noise in the data. 
And so the, the loadings are the eigenvectors of our covariance matrix and uh, the, the gamma here is our eigenvalues. And so this the eigenvalues are telling us basically how much variance is captured by each uh, score and loading pair. Um, so we get out uh, the, the different matrices that explains about the relationship between the samples and the variables and also what percentage of variance. And that percentage of variance can be important because if a if a principal component captures more variance, that means that the majority of the differences uh, are captured in that principal component. And so when we when the algorithm for principal components analysis, it takes the original matrix, the covariance matrix, and calculates out the first principal component. And then everything else is considered this residual matrix. And then that re residual matrix becomes the net the new. Uh, matrix to determine principal component two. And this process continues until you're down to a residual matrix that just contains noise. And so the because of that, the variance in your first principal component is always higher than your second and your third and so forth. Uh, um, but it's also important to remember that each principal component is calculated after subtracting the previous principal component out. Uh, so we're looking at the the sequential uh, variance in the data set. So um, when you do these calculations, you know, new computers nowadays are pretty powerful, even the ones you just buy off the shelf. However, when you start dealing with very large sets of data, um, you can, these data sets can be uh, pretty large and they can use a lot of resources. And so when you when you're running these algorithms, it, you need a computer that has a lot of RAM. Uh, it's good to have the newest processors and a large hard drive because you can be processing data sets that are uh, you know, up to 50 or 100 gigabytes in some cases. And so um, the, the more efficient your programming is done, the better. There's people who are playing around with doing cloud computing to try to off source some of the CPU time and RAM onto other computers. Um, but Bonnie Tyler came up with a rule uh, that the amount of RAM that you need is always two times the amount of RAM that you currently have. Uh, and I this is something I've run into a lot. I My computer that I use has 128 gigs of RAM um, and I sometimes still am pushing the limits of my system. So, um, so if we want to tame the the Sims data dinosaur, we need we need good computers. Uh, and if you you can run into two issues with that. One is that it will just take a very long time to process the data, so you may have to start something and wait a long time, or you'll run out of RAM and this, the algorithm will crash. Um, Okay, so once we once we have our results, we've gotten our data. Um, sometimes it turns out they, they can be difficult to interpret. Sometimes you can have overlapping trends that come out in your results. Um, and in, if you're looking at image data, you can have score images that are representing a combination of many different peaks. Um, in some cases, the results that you get depend on the scaling, for example, for principal components analysis, or the initial guess that you use for MCR and some other segmentation methods. Um, but when you properly carry out multivariate analysis, it cannot show something that doesn't already exist in the data. You can improperly scale your data to accentuate something like noise or something in your data that's not really important, um, but it, it won't create things that aren't there. Um, and then sometimes it's hard to visualize or conceptualize what you're looking at because, for example, in these a lot of these multivariate analysis, analysis methods, you can end up with results uh, in multiple dimensions, and it's hard to visualize anything more than three, three dimensions. Um, so, so it's important to think about how you display and how we interpret the data. So we're going to go through uh, some things here talking about that. So uh, 
Um, here I'm showing an example of a scores plot. I find it's most useful to plot your scores uh, with just as your samples versus a principal component. Um, it's good to show where the zero line is so that people know uh, when you're looking at your positive scores and negative scores. It sh you should show the percent variance that's captured with whatever factor that you're showing, because this gives important information to uh, how how much information is captured in that. Um, and then it's useful to show 95% confidence limits. So here the the solid dot or, or the open circles are individual data points and the little dots are the 95% confidence limits. Um, and then when looking at this, you can see that here we have uh, a sample that had fibrinogen on it and then a control sample. And we can see there's differences between these because they show up on different sides of the principal component axis. And um, you can also see, for example, on the control, there's some variation between the, these are two different samples, five data points on each sample. And so sample two here had a lot more variance than sample one. So we're getting multiple pieces of information uh, from this plot. When we display our loading, so this is going to tell us what's why or why we saw separation between the samples. So here I'm plotting the loading value versus the mass. So it looks kind of like a mass spectrum, but I must point out it is not a mass spectrum. These are loadings plots. Um, and we have once again our, our principal component axis labeled with the variance. Um, sometimes it's useful to put a, dis a, ma a descriptor that says, so up here we've got fragments from amino acids, and here we have fragments from the polymer substrate. Um, and since you, there's a lots of peaks that are showing up here, but it's best to only label the highest loading so that you don't make the plot look too complicated. Um, and then when we're looking at this, we can see now that, so we had our sample that had fibrinogen on it, is showing uh, high loadings for amino acid peaks, and the control is showing higher uh, loadings for peaks that had uh, that are from the substrate polymer. Um, so we can quickly see differences, chemical differences of why those samples look different in the scores plot. So a quick note: um, I, I've read in several papers and heard people say this at presentations that principal components analysis is confusing because it has negative numbers, and I I don't understand this comment because any any axis has a positive and negative sign, and positive and negative have no intrinsic meaning in multivariate analysis. It just tells you which samples and variables correspond with each other. So the important thing is to remember that positive scores go with positive loadings and negative scores go with negative loadings. But positive and negative have no in inherent meaning. So if I if I ran principal components analysis, this is a set of uh, self-assembled monolayers. We can see here on principal component one, um, the samples separate out from each other, and we have a series of peaks that separate these two samples. If we took this whole data set and multiplied it by negative one, we can see it flips the axes for the scores and it flips the axes for the loadings. However, the relationship between the samples and loadings does not change. We still have the light blue samples here correspond with uh, these sets of peaks. And same thing here, they correspond with these sets of peaks. So, um, so there's no reason to, to be afraid of negative numbers when we're running multivariate analysis. And the other thing to remember is that a peak that has a negative loading does not imply that it has a negative intensity. It just means that it showed that those peaks corresponded with the negative side of the principal component uh, axis. Okay, so any type with principal components analysis or any type of analysis that gives you factor scores and loadings, you have to interpret them in pairs. So the PC1 scores go with PC1 loadings and so forth. Um, and in general, what you can say is that samples that have high positive scores on a given principal component uh, 
correspond with variables with high positive loadings. And what that means is that a, uh, a sample with high score on a given principal component will have a higher relative intensity for those variables um, on the for the uh, for the loadings on the same principal component. So to show you what that means, here we have a this is a series of self-assembled monolayers. Uh, we have sample number on the x-axis, principal component score on principal component one here. And so we can see the different chain lengths from C6 here to C18, and they all cluster together. And then on principal component one, we see our loadings here. Uh, and we also see that there's one outlier here, the, the C9 um, sample uh, has a much higher score value here. So if we take and we look at the intensity trends, so we take one of these peaks, we can see that uh, a peak here that has a positive loading shows an increase in intensity from the C6 to the C18, which is the same general trend we see in the scores plot here. We see the scores increasing from C6 to C18. However, if we look at this peak here, we can see that uh, the, the uh, C9 SAMs have a really high intensity of this peak, and then a few of these others. If you recognize this peak, this is the 73 peak from PDMS. And so on this principal component, there's actually two trends going on. One is the increase in intensity of these fragments from the self-assembled monolayer due to chain length. And one is the trend in the PDMS contamination, which is why this um, C9 sample has such a high score on this axis. <clears throat> When we're looking at imaging data, so uh, when we process this, we're taking our image. In this case, I have a 256 by 256 image with a number of peaks n. I then unfold that data. So we're going to take the data and put it out so that we now have uh, a each pixel becomes a spec is a spectrum. And so we're going to treat that as just individual spectrums from 1 to 65,536. So we basically just take the pixels and put them into a matrix. And the variables here now are the peak area intensities, just like we did with spectra. So then we're going to take this unfolded matrix. We're going to do our pre-processing, run our multivariate analysis method. Then we're going to refold the data so that we can display the scores now as an image. Um, so we have, for, uh, we can display each of the scores for the different components separately. In SIMS imaging data, when you're displaying scores, it's useful to use strong contrasting colors where black is zero. Um, so this is the default uh, heat or hot map in MATLAB. And in this map, zero is actually orange. So it's kind of challenging to know where zero is and what's positive and what's negative. Um, so there's lots of different options you can do where you can use like a, a different color scheme where one color is positive, one color is negative, and black is zero, which makes it easier to interpret. It's also useful to pick colors that won't uh, affect people who have color blindness. So a grayscale is often good. Um, and there, I forgot to put a link on here, but there's there's a website that you can go and check your color scheme, and it will tell you whether someone with color blindness will actually be able to see uh, the images. Um, another thing that I've found, and this is included in my software package, um, so if you take your original scores, you can separate out the positive and negative scores and display them separately. Uh, and that allows you to really clearly see where things are showing up um, uh, in your positive and negative scores. And so, and when I do this, I multiply the negative scores by negative one. So they're displayed on a zero to some positive number. And that's fine as long as you remember to do that with both your scores and your loadings. So in interpreting your data from your scores and your loadings, we have our scores plot and our loadings plot. And so if we plotted the image now for a peak that has a positive loading, we'll see that it has intensity here in this bright region here that has positive scores. 
And if we did the same thing for something that has a negative loading, we'll see that we, we get in this analysis. So I'm going to go through now uh, a series of examples using a polymer mixture. So this is a polyethylene glycol, PMMA, and polystyrene that were dropped onto a silicon wafer. Uh, and then I also looked at uh, the pure polymers. The imaging was done on an ion top, top sims 5 with bismuth 3. And then I selected the peaks and exported them into uh, either BIF6 or BIF3 format into my toolbox, the MB toolbox. So I'm gonna go through an example of all these different methods using the same data set so you can get an idea of what these different methods can do. Um, starting out with just manual analysis. So this is your basic SIMS interpretation where we're gonna look manually at the data and find what's unique. Um, we can use the reference spectra to browse through the data. Um, and this is important because for any anytime you're doing multivariate analysis, you also, you still need to understand the basics of SIMS data interpretation. So you need how to, to know how to do this type of analysis. Um, one thing, Dave, I was in a conversation with David Skur, and one time he told me that he simply takes his data and sorts it by contrast. So it takes the images and it allows you to see things that have similar spatial distributions. And I'm not sure how well this shows up because it's there's so many images, but you can, this is a SIMS data set from the polymer sorted by contrast. And you can already start to see that there's different uh, areas that correspond with each other. And so if we go through, we can find areas that are similar and these all correspond to peg peaks, and then other areas that are similar that correspond with the PMMA, and then other areas that are similar that correspond with polystyrene peaks. And so just doing a manual analysis, we can our eyes are good enough, we can pick out uh, individual trends and find a series of peaks that, are cor that correspond with each of these samples. If we then take the most uh, intense of these peaks from each of the different polymers, we can create an RGB overlay, and we can see that we're pretty clearly separating out PMMA and polystyrene. And then down here, there's some overlap between um, the PEG and PMMA, because we're getting kind of an orange color instead of red, or orangish yellow instead of red. But we can see where these different polymers are distributed from a simple uh, manual analysis. And then if we look at these peaks, we can just individually uh, each of the distributions from these different peaks uh, here. So then if we take that data set and instead we use principal components analysis, uh, PCAs assumes a linear relationship between variables, which in most cases with SIMS that's true. There may be some that it's not. It is scale dependent. So uh, that means that variables with larger values look more important. And that's why we need to do our proper scaling. Um, and then uh, we're going. It's going to highlight the what these differences are in the, in the sample. So here I took the 107 peaks that were there before from positive ion data. I Poisson scaled and mean centered the data, and then um, I'm going to look at the positive negative scores separately as we go through this. So this is the PC1 positive scores, and you can see. Uh, the score image here. And then if you look at the peaks here, you can see these are almost all characteristic peaks of polystyrene. If we go to the uh, principal component one negative scores, uh, we see the distribution here. And here we see we have a, a combination of PEG and PMMA peaks. And this kind of makes sense because when we did the manual analysis, we saw that this lower region showed an overlap of these two species. And so it would make sense that principal components analysis would find those species together. And then the PC2 positive loadings, we see this distribution and most all of these peaks are related to, or to polymethacrylates or PMMA. 
Uh, and then our negative scores for PC2 gives us an overlap between a lot of different peaks um, from different things. So this is kind of a combination of, of different um, components. But if we take the PC1 negative, PC2 positive, and PC1 positive uh, scores, we can overlap them. And we see here uh, we can get, uh, uh, once again, a, a clear separation between these different uh, materials. It is interesting to point out that by doing this, we get a, almost a clear red color down here, even though we know there's an overlap between the two polymers. So it's important to recognize um, that principal components analysis here may be missing something about the data in the way this was processed. If we then go to uh, math or maximum autocorrelation factors, this uses a, a different input matrix or different scores matrix is calculated slightly different um, where we're doing a rotation uh, from what's called a shift matrix. So it's a your covariance matrix minus a shifted covariance matrix. Um, whoops. And so this is it's going to try to maximize the variation across the image while minimizing variation between neighboring pixels. So we're trying to look at the, the wide differences across this, the image. So here, once again, uh, looking at the positive PC1 scores, we see polystyrene peaks in that distribution. Um, the negative PC1 scores, we're getting peg peaks. And uh, the positive PC2 scores, we're getting PMMA peaks. And then the negative PC2 scores, we're getting just some random noise uh, in the image and we do the rgb overlay of those factors and we get a very clear separation it looks very similar to principal components analysis and in most cases if you properly scale your principal components analysis data it will look exactly the same as uh math um okay so then uh multivariate cur curve resolution this is trying to deconvolute the data into so-called pure components. It's important to remember that it's forcing the data into something that it considers pure, um, but it the pure components depends on, or whether you end up with apps, real pure components depends on whether there are pure components in the system and how many factors you tell it to calculate because you have to give it um, some guess of what's there. And usually you use some sort of initial results as a get initial guess for uh, MCR um, to give it a starting point for the algorithm. In this case, I use the math results. You can also use like the PCA results. And here I guess three factors. So here we have a uh, factor one, the component that it calculated and the spectra. MCR always, you, the algorithm is set typically to only give you positive values. So um, some people like that because they don't like negative numbers for some reason. But here you see our polystyrene peaks for factor one, our PMMA peaks for factor two, and our polyethylene glycol peaks for factor three. Um, and so we do the overlay here and um, and we see here, interestingly, we get back this kind of yellowish orange color down here where we, ha we have the overlap be between PEG and PMMA. Um, and so it's capturing something very similar to what we see in principal components analysis. It's important to remember with MCR that since you're telling, you have to tell it how many factors to calculate, uh, that it will it will determine something that it considers a pure component, but it may or may not actually be a pure component. Um, you have to actually go back and check and see if that what it found is something uh, real. Another way of clustering the data is with what's called k-means. And here it tries to find groups within the data into a number of k groups. So k is just a variable that you tell it how many groups you want to calculate. And it usually does the group Based, based on a Euclidean distance from a centroid. So you basically define some random centroids. You calculate the difference between all the points between those centroids, and then you cluster 
the data into whichever group it has the, the smallest distance from those centroids. And then you iterate through that until you get convergence on groups that fit the number of groups that you've um, that you've defined or told it to calculate. Um, so it will always find K groups. So you need to make sure that those results make sense. So if we do K means with a cluster of three, we find that cluster one gives us a combination of PMMA and polystyrene peaks. Cluster two gives us polyethylene glycol peaks in this distribution. And cluster three gives us polystyrene peaks in this distribution. If we go through and uh, here we did K equals three, we could do K equals four or K equals five. And you can see that if we go to a higher number of factors, we actually just start pulling out combinations of different or different combinations of different components where there is a mixture between these two uh, or these different polymers. And so it's really up to you to decide whether which one of these gives you a valid interpretation of your data. Um, and so it still takes user input to be able to know um, what is the information from this that uh, is important. Um, so another one method that's in my toolbox that I came up with is a, a color overlay, but it's done in a different way. So you select a peak or group of peaks to display. And then for each color channel, you assign all the pixels or voxels uh, with a specific number so that the sums are all a unique number. So you have these numbers. So if you took uh, peak one and peak two plus peak two, it'll be different from the sum of peak one and peak three and, and so forth. So you can do this to be able to find overlapping signal between uh, your voxels or pixels and isolate of where you have pure signal. So to illustrate what I mean by this, so if we had our original images, we assign an intensity to these so that when we overlay these, we get uh, unique numbers. And then you can isolate out where you see one and five and 13 and so forth. And so if I do that with uh, the this data set we've been looking at, I have uh, the characteristic peaks for the different um, the different polymers. And if I do the this three color overlay algorithm, uh, we see we have this area that has our peg. We see an area that has PMMA and polystyrene. And these upper three images show area where just these signals are showing up with no overlap. And then here we see an image showing us where PEG and PMMA peaks overlap. There's really no areas where PEG and polystyrene are overlap. We have an area where PMMA and polystyrene overlap, and then an area where all three of the polymers overlap. And then this is an overlay of all of these images. So you can see that we have a, a wide range of different distributions within these polymers, um, which makes sense because they were they were randomly mixed together. <clears throat> There's another method uh, that I found in an article from quite a long time ago called it's uh, Paul Gelati and Hans Gron created this, and they they call it multivariate image analysis. Um, and what they do is they run principal components analysis, and then they create a cross plot of one principal component with another principal component. And it shows you clusters of scores with similar values. And then you can select regions within this and figure out basically what these scores correspond with and what peaks are intense in those pixels. So here I've got a plot of principal component one versus principal component two. If we select this cluster, of pixels here, we see it corresponds with this part of the image, and it gives us a spectra that looks like polyethylene glycol uh, peaks. And then cluster two down here gives us polystyrene peaks and the area where polystyrene is. And then cluster three, which is hard to see on this image, but cluster three gives us these PMMA peaks. And then there's cluster four, which gives us this combination between PMMA and polystyrene um, in this middle region. <clears throat> 
And uh, it, it's, a, it's kind of an interesting method that I don't think many people have used. It kind of disappeared in the literature, uh, but it is included in my toolbox if anyone wants to play around with it. Um, another way you can look at your data is what I call dice and classify. So we take control spectra from our pure compounds. We build a principal component analysis model from these pure compounds. And then you collect your image on a mixture, and then you can dice the data into different size pixels. So whatever size pixel, as long as they're square, and then project that into the principal component analysis model to classify the pixels. And th in this case, I'm using an Euclidean distance from the centroid of the pure component clusters in the principal component analysis model. So if we do that, we can take uh, our mixed polymer image. And here, I th this is a a two by two pixel classification. And you can see it picks out the region with PEG, the polystyrene and the PMMA, similar to what we've seen before. Um, and so this is, this can be an interesting way of asking the question of, um, you know, basically where, where do I see something that corresponds with polystyrene, PMMA or polyethylene glycol within your uh, your image data set based on controls of each of these polymers. So a different way of approaching um, the analysis. So the, the last little part here, this is not stuff that's included in my toolbox, but this is some interesting work that Spencer Thomas has been put together from NPL. And he's been working on an advanced neural network. <clears throat> and so neural networks use a, uh, a method where you take your inputs and map them to your outputs using a set of nodes that do some uh, a type of mathematical transformation. Um, and Spencer, usually neural networks are a black box. So you get out a result that looks interesting, but it's almost impossible to interpret why you get the results that you have. Um, Spencer's system, uh, he's done it in a way that you can do your data dimension re uh, reduction and still extract out spectra and spatial features while maintaining a relationship with your original data, which means you can you can trace the results back to why you're getting this difference. Um, and so he uses uh, what are called autoencoders um, to do a dimensionality reduction of the data. And then you can pull out different uh, characteristic things from the data set. Uh, and so if you want more information, uh, I believe this has been published now. I don't have an updated reference, but um, uh, he has a very nice system where he's able to do this. And the other nice thing is that once you have this data that's encoded, you can use that in any type of classification method. So you can use your, your K uh, nearest neighbors or k-means types uh, classification or linear discriminant analysis or different. So you can use different types of classification methods using um, the outputs from his neural network. OK, so uh, there's a whole range of software packages you can use. Um, there's commercial ones that I, I've never tried them with Sims data other than the PLS toolbox, which is a commercial toolbox based in MATLAB that's quite nice. It, it, it has basically every multivariate analysis method I think that's ever been developed. Um, and then there's ones that are either open source or free. So there's my toolbox that you can get here. Uh, there's a spectral analysis toolbox that Alan Race came up with. Gustavo Trindade has come up with his own little MATLAB tool. And then there's some other uh, things that can be used. Um, I have a bunch of reading here that you could do. These are articles that talk about multivariate analysis or the application of multivariate analysis to SIMS data that I find useful. Um, and so the the take home message that I hope I can give you is that multivariate analysis methods are simply tools that can help you determine what's changing and where it's changing. They can't replace having good interpretation skills and they shouldn't be used as a black box. You still need to understand your SIMS data. You need to understand 
uh, when you want to apply these and, and how and why. Um, and you still need to have a good experimental design or else you're going to end up with a mess that's very difficult to interpret. Um, so with that, this is a, a link to the web page that has tutorials and links. It has my software and my software. I've got um, tutorials on every function for every part of it that you can read through. Um, and I'd also, you can email me with questions. I'm going to post these slides with my notes um, on the website soon, uh, once I have time to upload it and get it set up. And then I'll make sure that that link is provided to um, the Sims Society. And with that, I thank you for your attention and I would be happy to answer any questions that you have.